and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I'd like to welcome our audience from YouTube that joins us for the message each week and uh, recording it here at the second service today. Uh, glad to have you with us as well. Um, a small but faithful crowd from all over the United States. Uh, our sermon title today is My Beloved Son from Mark 9, the Transfiguration message, Transfiguration Sunday. Uh, as we enter the Lenten season, again we consider the suffering and death of Christ. He walks on his way to the cross. It's an account we know very well. But nothing surprises us because we've heard about so much. You know, we know how it comes out. We know how it comes out. But can you imagine uh, for a moment what it would be like to be the disciples of Jesus? They walked through passion, the passion story of Christ, and they didn't know how it was going to come out. That really makes a difference in how you perceive it at the moment. Uh, not that Jesus didn't try to tell them. He, he told them time and again, the Son of Man would be turned over and suffer and die on the third day. But really, you got to give them a break. How, how could they comprehend what that would mean? They couldn't comprehend that. That was outside of their ability to think about that. And, and you know, too, just think about Jesus. Uh, he, to whatever degree we don't understand, set aside his divinity. So really, he went through the passion, uh, knowing some things, but he went through as a man. You know, he felt the pain, emotionally, physically, spiritually. He felt it as a man, experienced it as uh, a true man. So God did something special for uh, Jesus and the disciples. Uh, they went up on the mountain. Uh, did Jesus know this was going to happen in advance in his humanity? I don't know. Maybe. And, um, you know, the longer I preach, the less I know. <laughs> 30 years ago, I knew a lot for sure. <laughs> and a lot of times I say, uh, I don't know. <laughs> and they got up there and all of a sudden, this transfiguration event took place when he shone with uh, brilliant heavenly glory. Uh, probably still toned down, you know, not full, full throttle God. But uh, still, they saw this glory, and Moses and Elijah were there. And uh, it was an amazing event for those three disciples to experience uh, ahead of what was about to come to them. And then that voice spoke. This is my beloved son, the son whom I love. Listen to him. And on this Valentine's Day, thinking of that theme of love, my beloved son. That feels good, huh? My beloved son. Uh, you, you like to hear that, don't you? I love you. You are special to me. Um, that feels good to hear that. It's reassuring uh, when times get tough down the line to know that you are loved and cared for by someone, especially someone who's watching out for you. And uh, we'll see the theme of love here from Calvary uh, all the way to Calvary. There's a song that puts it this way. I think it's kind of neat. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the gulf that God did span at Calvary. Uh, I'm no great theologian, but uh, I think I'm correct in saying that love is God's primary attribute because it's his holiness that can't have our sin in his presence, but his love made a way to, uh, for us to be a children of God and to be declared righteous and clean and forgiven in his sight and go to heaven. Well, my beloved son, let's look at it together. And the first point I want to make is he's God's beloved son because he's divine. Because he's divine. Mark 9, verses 2 through 4. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him 
and led them up on a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white. That's how this translation puts it. Dazzling white. Whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Which mountain? I don't know. Some say Mount Hermon way up by Syria, but most scholars seem to think it's just one of those mountains in the center of Israel somewhere. Where, and um, I don't know, Mount Gerizim or something like that. Um, how can we describe who Jesus is? How can we describe who Jesus is? It's very important that we get it right. Um, the great theologians of the ages have come up with various descriptions of how the Trinity, uh, I understand that Jacob had Sunday school today about the Trinity. Is that right? And uh, how it all works, you know. And uh, they've come up with, after a lot of Bible study and discussion, carefully weighing their words, uh, uh, descriptions of who God is and who Jesus is. Now, there's one in the Athanasian Creed. Now, I guess once a year you're supposed to repeat the Athanasian Creed. Uh, maybe I'll get the courage to do it sometime, but it's a long one. It's really long. And I'm going to just read you one paragraph of how the great theologians uh, at a time when they wanted to make sure that the, that the belief about Jesus was correct and not heretical, this is how they describe in words, in words, who Jesus is. Now, this is just one paragraph of a many paragraph creed. It is also necessary for eternal salvation that one faithfully believe that our Lord Jesus Christ became a man. For this is the right faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at once God and man. I'm hanging on so far. He is God begotten before the ages of the substance of the Father, and he is man born in the world of the substance of the mother. I'm losing it now, but I'm trying. Perfect God and perfect man with reasonable soul, and of course the definition of reasonable there probably has to be the definition of a thousand years ago and not the definition of today, with reasonable soul human and human flesh, equal to the Father with respect to his Godhead and inferior to the Father with respect to his manhood. Although he is God and man, he is not two Christs, but one Christ. One that is to say, not by changing the Godhead into flesh, but by taking the humanity into God. I think that's kind of neat. Not, not bringing God into a human, but bringing humanity into God. I still don't know what it means. One indeed, not by confusion of substance, but by unity in one person. So that's who Jesus is according to a committee of theologians. Uh, undoubtedly, it's a good explanation. One that has been worked on and fought about. God didn't give us that explanation, though. The church did. The church did. God gave us something that I can handle. I'm not saying this isn't important, but God gave us something that I can handle in describing Jesus. He gave us Matthew 9, verses 3 and 4. Who is Jesus? His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there before them was Elijah and Moses who were talking to Jesus. Who is Jesus? Someone who ate and walked and talked with the disciples, went on a mountain, became dazzling white and radiant and talked to Moses who had been dead for 1,500 years. And all I go is, wow. That's Jesus. Wow. Gives a picture that I can handle. 
White as LED headlights, as a welding arc. White as a lightning bolt, talking with Moses, talking with Elijah. Wow. The disciples knew that Jesus was a man. I think they suspected he was divine. But this sealed the deal for them. This sealed the deal for them. It erased the doubts they were struggling with. He is God in human form. And that is exactly what they needed to know for about what they were going to face. And that's exactly what you and I need to know and be reminded of day after day. This very human Jesus is also God and he went to the cross by his choice. He went to the cross by his choice. And he allows suffering and challenges in your life and mine by his choice. Not that he's not able to change it. Amos Dirud was the kind of the first real long-term dean of our seminary back in the 1960s. They brought him home from the mission field in Madagascar where he was teaching pastors, and he became the first free Lutheran uh, dean of the seminary. He had just kind of retired before I went to seminary in 1984. And uh, Mark Antel, did you have Amos Dirud as the dean when you were there for seminary? Was he still dean or was Dr. Munseth? So you're kind of the end of the Amos Dirud era, aren't you? Wow, you're older than I thought you were. Um, it, but anyway, Amos Dirud, do you know what his favorite hymn was? It's all about this. How, how Jesus is God but chose to go to the cross. He'd request it. His favorite cl uh, chorus, you know, at the pastor's conference uh, was, uh, not I forgot. <laughs> but his favorite hymn, I remember that. Um, Oh, it's, his name is wonderful. He always wanted that one for chorus. But his favorite hymn was this. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the earth and make him, set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. The disciples would realize after the transfiguration that everything Jesus went through all the way to the cross and at the cross was his choice. It was his choice because he is divine, my beloved son. And the second thing, he's divine. He's the beloved son of God because he's fully human. He's fully human. Mark 9, 5 through 8. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone except Jesus. <laughs> the King James says, they saw Jesus only. Jesus only. Just there he was in his full humanity again. Uh, the old Lutheran Bible Institute in downtown Minneapolis, that was the theme song of the Bible Institute. It's in our hymnal, Jesus Only. It comes from this passage right here. Jesus Only. To Peter, what did he call him? Rabbi. Rabbi. Notice, even after the glory that they saw, um, and, and even in the midst of the glory, he called him Rabbi. He didn't say, oh my God. He said that later, my Lord, my God. But at this point, he was still his teacher. The disciples knew him as a great and powerful teacher. His words created faith. Um, think about in John chapter 6, uh, when he fed the 5,000, word got out that they got free food, and the crowds just multiplied, and the, the whole thing was not going the direction Jesus wanted it to go. So he preached a song sermon about eating his body and drinking his blood, and people said, this is a hard statement, I can't take this. Uh, I wanted to hear what the menu is for the next meal, and they left. And uh, 
I added that thing about the menu, but that's kind of implied in there. And, and they left, and the disciples there were there with Jesus, and Jesus looked at them and said, uh, are you going to leave too? And Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. His words created faith in their hearts. He changed their lives. And then Peter uh, blurted out, let's build three shelters for Moses and Elijah and you. Um, why? Oh, there have been a lot of sermons and talks about these three shelters, right? Haven't there been? Uh, all speculation. Uh, it, says here, uh, it says here that he, he, didn't even, he didn't know what to say. They were so frightened. Uh, some of you, when you don't know what to say, you stay quiet. Some of us, when we don't know what to say, we just start talking. And uh, sometimes I scare my family. I start talking about what I'm thinking about. And I say, no, I'm just thinking out loud. <laughs> These are just ideas. They'll, they'll never come to pass. Don't let me scare you. And that's the way Peter was. He was thinking out loud. Maybe he wanted uh, the situation to endure for a while, uh, like the Feast of Tabernacles, make little tabernacles, and he'd run down and get the other disciples, and they could get that camp meeting going. Maybe he wanted to build some memorials. Uh, we don't know, and I don't know if Peter even knew what he was saying. It was so overwhelming, we know that. And uh, suddenly, the brightness was gone after they heard the voice, listen to him. My beloved son, listen to him. And what did they see? Jesus in all his humanity again. Jesus in all his humanity. And that's what they saw all the way to the cross. And God told them, the Father, listen to him. Listen to him. Listen to him. Their peek into his divinity was done. And now they see the humanity of Jesus again. You know, we all have special memories of spiritual highlights in our life, uh, don't we? I went to a Bible study group in college, and we had some tremendous uh, spring break uh, camps meetings down in uh, uh, Paducah, Kentucky. Jonathan Creek Baptist Assembly. And my, how many college students came and came to know Jesus and uh, and, and, uh, and uh, it was a powerful, powerful experience. And so there's still a Facebook page for all these old timers now uh, who are reminiscing about those great days when God moved mightily in their life. I, I, I think of uh, great days I experienced up to uh, Lake Coronas, Paul, at the Bible camp up there. You were there, I'm sure, many times, and the speakers and the move of God and People who are touched, you know, in their hearts by the moving of the Lord at the various Bible camps. In my first church, uh, a lot of the older people were really touched uh, in Barron County, Wisconsin, when they used to have Youth for Christ meetings there back in the 1950s. Uh, that's how Billy Graham got started with Youth for Christ. And, and, uh, and there were powerful meetings back in those days that were these farmers came to know Jesus in a life-changing way. Uh, for some people, it's Bible school, uh, AFLBS, uh, some real moves of God when you're there. Uh, but all of these counters have one thing in common. People coming to know Jesus Christ in a real, living, and personal way. Uh, it was interesting, Roger, Hoikala, and I where are you, Roger? You're here? Yeah, okay. i got to tell the real accurate version then now. All right, you're here. Uh, i got to be careful. Uh, it's easy to expand on things like fishing stories. Uh, Roger and I were here during WMF, so he and I sat and visited uh, in the office while the ladies met yesterday. And um, it was kind of interesting, Roger. Uh, your cousin, kind of like second cousin, once removed, is dying of cancer. Up in what? Maple Grove or somewhere? Up in Blaine. And, uh, and uh, Roger read his devotional the other day from our Daily Bread. And, and uh, he said that uh, God really spoke to him. It was about sharing Jesus. And 
You know the Holy Spirit. You just know it's God talking to you. Wanted him to call up his cousin who's dying of cancer and talk to him about his soul. And he got the courage to do that and called him up and asked him if he was ready, if it was well with his soul, if he made peace with God, something like that. And, and, and his cousin gave him the opportunity to share the gospel in a simple way, you know, kind of four spiritual laws way you kind of said to me. And uh, did your cousin pray to invite Christ into his heart or you gave him that opportunity? You gave him that opportunity. But the beautiful thing about it was this. Uh, he invited Roger and Carol to come and visit him this week. Is that right? The door is open. He's dying. And the gospel touching him. He's, he's having his transfiguration mountain experience right now. Seeing Jesus not only as a teacher, but as the savior of his soul. Jesus only, son of God, son of man, and finally the beloved son of God because he's a willing sacrifice, a willing sacrifice. Uh, Mark 9, 9 and 10. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone they had, what they had seen until the son of man had risen from the dead. And they kept this matter to themselves discussing what rising from the dead meant. What rising from the dead meant. Jesus told them not to say anything about it until he'd risen from the dead. And this baffled the disciples. This baffled them, rising from the dead. But I started thinking about it. You know, really should it have. How was Jesus introduced by John the Baptist at the beginning of his ministry? Remember that? Jesus came to be baptized, and John said, Behold the what? Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. And for hundreds of years, and for their full lifetime, the disciples had come to Passover, and that beautiful, innocent, little, perfect lamb that they loved so much was killed and his blood was shed to atone for their sins. So when Jesus was introduced, not as the King of Kings, but as the Lamb of God, they should have realized, and they didn't till afterwards, that he is literally the Lamb of God who doesn't take away my sin or the, my family's sin or Israel's sin, but he takes away the sin of the whole world. So therefore, he must be a perfect lamb who's going to die. What a mystery. That's a mystery that all these lambs had pointed to Jesus. And he willingly became that lamb. Undoubtedly Moses who met with Jesus. Just think about that on the Transfiguration Mountain. Moses who wrote the first five books of the Bible and all the details about sacrifices. And then Elijah, who on Mount Carmel had made that altar and sacrifice, and the priests of Baal had tried to get fire from heaven for theirs. It never happened. And the fire of heaven came down and consumed that sacrifice. There they were with Jesus, maybe just assuring him, this is it, go forward, keep your face straight to the cross. You are the Lamb of God. From before the foundation of the world, this has been worked out. And in order for these sinful human beings to be cleansed and saved and go to heaven forever, you've got to do this. You've got to do this. And he did. Willingly. He did. Willingly. So that we could be his children. As we start Holy Week this week, Ash Wednesday... And as we refer, review the passion of the Christ, our Lord, our, our, our world desperately needs Jesus. Desperately needs Jesus. And we shouldn't be as negative as we are. Oh, we don't have prayer in school anymore. Isn't it terrible? Oh, people don't come to church like they used to. Isn't it terrible? Folks, we can put that spin on it, but it's not healthy. We got to be like Hannah Chalmers. 
on Chicago Avenue in Minneapolis who would love to be living there to this day in the midst of the riots and trouble. Hannah Chalmers lived there. All the Norwegians and Swedes lived there back when R.V. Erickson lived down there and some of you lived there. And they all moved to Apple Valley and to, and to Richfield. And the neighborhood changed. And it became a lot of Native Americans and blacks and other minorities. And they said to Hannah, Hannah, you got your little Bible bookstore right there. You live above it right there. Aren't you going to move out with the rest of us? And Hannah Chalmers said, oh, absolutely not. She said, I have wanted to be a foreign missionary all my life, and I've never had the opportunity. And she said, God has answered my prayer. He brought the mission field to me. She was thrilled that her neighborhood didn't know Jesus because she had the opportunity to tell them. What an attitude. What an attitude. So filled with love for the Savior and love for lost souls. Jesus is God's beloved Son, and he loves us very much. And my prayer, 19, 2021, we got that cross out here, that wonderful cross. Now that people can see it again, that some anonymous person cut down the tree that was in the way. Uh, He's been blessing people for all these years, challenging people at times too, that cross. And I am praying that 2021 will be the year when God unveils people's eyes and draws them to you and to your homes and to your lives and to this church and to this place here. And 2021 is going to be a year of great harvest of lost souls who come to know Jesus Christ personally as their Lord and Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty for all who believe. I'm excited. May this Lenten season refresh in us that love that we had for Jesus when we first met him and excite us about the opportunities that lie before us to uh, invite people here. We'll get the drive-up service going too again in a few weeks and another opportunity. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all human comprehension guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together and twice through sing that old time youth for Christ chorus, For God So Loved the World. Thank you for worshiping with us today. For more information or to contact us, please visit us on the web at mnvalleychurch.org or find us on Facebook at Minnesota Valley Church.